Okay, so um, this is a short presentation that covers um, the what is design lecture for the IS masters. And uh, we talked earlier uh, during class, uh, which was sort of a primer uh, on this presentation. We talked about um, the various aspects of design. And, uh, <clears throat> and we defined sort of what is design. And we talked about just briefly that design is something that is present in every sort of man-made artifact and every form of um, action and practice that is somehow manipulated, afforded, um, engineered based on some physical design of some sort. Because you can design people's behavior and you can design objects and, and, and artifacts and so on. So this is something that, that is present in many aspects of society. We briefly mentioned uh, two great thinkers uh, around design, Klaus Krippendorf, uh, a, a, a German scholar uh, responsible for a, a relatively um, paradigmatic book called The Semantic Turn. There is a link to a YouTube clip in this presentation, uh, about a one hour long lecture from Kunstfach in Stockholm back in 2012, 13, something like that, I think, where he, where he goes through his, um, his, his book in some great detail, actually, which is why we don't have the book on the literature list for this course, but we have this present his presentation instead. Uh, and then we have Nigel Cross, uh, who has written extensively on the history of design and, the hi and, a, and a history of the idea of uh, science versus design and what, what the difference is between science and design and how we can think about this. Now, design, design as, a, as a practice sort of was sprung out of the uh, rationality ideas in the 1920s uh, and came out of this um, idea that we should make design into some form of science. In other words, uh, design is something that should be structured, organized, um, analyzed, and formalized. Uh, so that there's a recipe for what is good design, as well as a recipe for what not to do and what would constitute bad design so that you can sort of repeatedly uh, avoid making mistakes and you can sort of rationalize and sign, make, make into a science this, this act of, of creation, if you like. And, and so there was a bit of a struggle uh, between the 1920s and the 1960s um, where in the, the 60s and 70s movement, there was a, a bit of a revolution, we might say, uh, some resistance to this, to this kind of scientification of design, if you like. Um, Herbert Simon came, uh, came out with his book, science of, The Science of the Artificial. Uh, there were lots of uh, discussions around the design process as a scientific process and the idea of machine language, in other words, uh, you know, we can, we can break down the act of creation or creating something into discrete steps and we can, we can uh, sort of discuss and analyze those steps. And if we can only understand the act of design well enough, it's possible to fix all these kinds of uh, environmental problems. Uh, some of which rose into prominence with the 1960s counterculture and the, 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 the women's uh, movement and uh, the, the campus revolutions and so on. And, and so and while, while this was a, a while this kind of um, view of design as a scientific process was prominent throughout most of the 20s and, 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 and to some extent the 60s, it was sort of in the late, mid to late 60s coming into the 70s. Uh, and I guess after the campus revolutions in the wake of these campus revolutions that there was a bit of a backlash, uh, a, a counter movement uh, against formal design methodologies where, where uh, uh, you didn't necessarily want rules and 
guidelines and best practices and 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 so on to understand design design was seen as a cre as a creative uh activity rather than something that could be understood sort of intellectually necessarily best um so there was a bit of a backlash there but but the idea but but industrial design as a as a technique as a as a science persisted and when we move into the 1980s there there were these prominent uh works uh of design literature that that came into prominence engineering design by um uh, G. Paul and Belts and Feldhausen and Grote, a short course in industrial design by Eskil Schalve, principle of engineering design by Hubka and conceptual design for engineers. Some examples of these these uh, these kind of seminal books that that really tried to uh, uh, discuss you know the differences between design and science and really um, wanted to formalize at least industrial design. Maybe not so much consumer design, but the design of machines, you know, if you like, uh, uh, the various designed artifacts that were in use in industry. And all this kind of emerged as a debate, uh, design versus science. And, and Gregory said in 1966 that the scientific method is a pattern of problem solving behavior employed in finding out the nature of what exists whereas the design method is a pattern of behavior employed in inventing things of value which do not yet exist. Science is analytic, design is constructive. So what he meant by that is that there are two separate legitimizing goals for design and science. And to some extent, they are a little counter to each other. They, they form some sort of counterbalance, we could say. So whereas good design is not something that you necessarily want to see repeated, uh, good design um, creative design is usually something that is unique, uh, forward thinking and progressive and, and breaks new ground and all this stuff doesn't have to be repeatable and certainly not copied because copied design, you know, worst cases leads to, 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 um, uh, you know, it's, it's criminal. Um, so, so, so copies and repeatability is not necessarily something that you, you attribute to good design or even creative design. Uh, on the other hand, science and a scientific method uh, is, of course, validated uh, using criteria that, that uh, you know, repeatability, right? So a good scientific method is highly repeatable. You know, you can perform the same study, the same sort of uh, practice over and over again and, ex and very well expect the same results. That's what you sort of want when you try to formalize something into guidelines that you want the predictability. The predictability is something that, that science brings to the table. But how do we, how do we co-join this idea of creation and creativity and intuition with something that is predictable when predictability is something that we want? Certainly in the commercial sector, you know, where you want, you know, you, you would like a design to be inherently uh, successful and, and valuable. So, so then what you get are three definitions of what science and design is. And, and this is kind of what evolved out of the 1970s and 80s discussions around, you know, how, how are we supposed to think about design? How are we supposed to think about science, you know, and the science of design? So what, what happened was that we, we differentiate between scientific design, which refers to the modern industrialized design, you know, the, the, the in, within industry, as distinct from, from this idea of sort of pre, the pre-industrial, the sort of craft-oriented uh, artisan design where you have the shoemakers and the blacksmiths and, 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 and whatnot. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an efficient um, process that is highly industrialized, meaning that it, it, uh, you can feed something into one end of the factory and out comes you know, copies of the same, variations of the same, and all these designs follow a certain uh, ethos or a certain way of thinking about design that is um, that, that makes it predictable. Now that is scientific design, very much like um, scientific management. You know the management idea from the 1920s. This is this is sort of sprung from the same idea that you want something to be 
measurable, divisible, um, cheaply produced predictability, um, and able to break something complex down into its component parts, and then design these parts and put them together, and, and you know you 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 reach some sort of predictable goal. <clears throat> Design science as a scientific method is a, a, a single sort of rationalized method that recognizes the laws of design and its activities and develop rules um, around sort of what design is and what it can be. Now, design science is an explicitly organized, rational, wholly systematic approach to design, not just the utilization of scientific knowledge of artifacts, but that design in some sense is a scientific activity in and of itself. That's a very controversial um, uh, assertment because obviously there are many, many, many that feel that the act of designing itself is not and will never be a scientific activity. In other words, that designing is in itself a non-scientific or ascientific activity. Uh, as, as Grant 1979 here says, that, that uh, the act of designing is creativity, it's, 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 it's based on sort of intuition and creativity and emotion. It's not something that is rationalized and, and uh, analyzed, you know. So, so the third thing we, we, uh, we, we try to define here then as an outcome of this science versus design discussion is the science of design itself. And the science of design refers to that body of work which attempts to improve our understanding of design through scientific, and by scientific we mean systematic, reliable methods of investigation. And, and let's be clear that a science of design is not the same as design science. Design science is a scientific method. The science of design is, uh, are these books and theories that want to increase our understanding of what design is. So it's an academic uh, field, you might say. Now, <clears throat> we arrive at the idea of semiotics, semantics, and syntax and pragmatics. Briefly, semiotics is the study of signs, as we know, and semantics is the study of what the signs mean. Syntax concerns the signs' relations to other signs. So, how does one sign refer to something else and how do, how do these different signs work together? And pragmatics allows us to understand uh, a single sign's use in different contexts, how meaning is transferred sort of contextually, you know, so that tears from someone uh, sitting alone in a room means sadness, whereas tears coming from a chef in a kitchen might mean that the onion is quite strong. So, so two different interpretations of the same sort of phenomenon, but it's contextualized, right? So we need to understand concept, context. And uh, so we get to this idea then where you have a designer that wants to encode some sort of meaning into a product, such as, you know, this one, for instance. And you have a um, user that attempt to decode that meaning. And when something is well designed, it means that the, the, the user is able to uh, decode the meaning that was inscribed by the designer and the product is understood and the boundaries of what constitutes you, you know, intended use and unintended use are clear. And we arrive at, you know, products that are understandable, that might not need, you know, manuals that are this thick. And so when we look at a product like this, and we talked briefly about this earlier in the in, in class today, the Eurorack modular synthesizer, an electronic music instrument that at first glance looks extremely complicated. There's no telling what all the chords and wires and stuff do. There's no logic, there's no apparent a um, uh, way of using this particular device. But what's interesting, you know, when we arrive at a, a concept of, of uh, product semantics is that sometimes, 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 um, this kind of um, unintelligibility, you know, this, this 
this uh, sort of uh, um, mysterious product design is intentional. It's meant to be very open in how you use something. It's meant to invite exploration and you don't really want to guide the user too much. So, so built into the design is this um, kind of openness, if you like. So, and, and that's that kind of stuff where we try to intuit or at least uh, research how the design of something influences how people actually think about a product and how they choose to use a product and, and so on is called product semantics. The study of how people attribute meaning to artifacts and interact with them accordingly. And product semantics, or, or which is, is a specific sort of subset of semantics, is a vocabulary and a methodology for designing artifacts in view of the meanings that they could acquire for their users and the communities of their stakeholders. So, so we, we sort of try to predict uh, what possible uses or what possible types of interaction a particular product can uh, generate. So, um, Victor Margolin said, you know, that design is as much an expression of feeling as an articulation of reason. It's an art as well as a science, a process and a product, an assertion of disorder and a display of order. So it's a clear view here from Victor Margolin about how, how design is something emotional as well as organized, something chaotic that, that refuses to be, to be um, uh, sort of measured and understood and quantified. Uh, but it's also a display of order. It's also, you know, it means, to, it means making choices. It means uh, taking something that is boundless and limitless make certain choices when it comes to materials and appearance, some aesthetic choice and stuff, and implementing them. So it means going from disorder to some sort of order by using some form of method and some form of knowledge about science and design. And so we arrive at Klaus Krippendorf's um, idea of the uh, stakeholder model and the life cycle of a design. And what Krippendorf talks about, as you'll see in your YouTube clip, and I won't go into detail here because it's better if you watch his, his presentation. He's much better at, at presenting his own stuff than I imagine that I am. Uh, but what he talks about is that <clears throat> there's no one user for a product. There's no such thing as I'm going to design a computer or I'm going to, de to design a coffee maker. And what I'm aiming at, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for the person who wants to drink the coffee and use this coffee maker, or I'm looking at the, the typical sort of office administrative person or a computer user person who's going to sit at the keyboard and use the computer. And that's the only person that I need to refer to when I design my product. Not true, says Krippendorf. Um, the actual end user is maybe the least important or significant person in a design project. So just very quickly, what does he argue then? Well, he argues that design, when a concept is developed for design, the first person or, or uh, um, shall we say, um, uh, entity, corporate entity, maybe even, that, that a designer has to deal with is the client. Someone is making an order for a design. Someone is, um, is, uh, has, has ordered, has, has contacted a, uh, an industrial design company and said, I want to buy a product design from you and, and these are the ideas that I have and this is what we want. And so the client <clears throat> could be a board member of a company, it could be uh, several, it could be all the board members of a company, it could be someone from an R&D development, engineering uh, department in a company. So, but somehow the designer has to interact with this client and the client is the person or corporate entity that is going to build the product and, and hopefully market it and say it, sell it and 
make money you know, from the product. Uh, the client, in turn, um, is dependent on corporate financing, right? So the client talks to corporate financing and securing sort of, well, these are the funds now that I have been able to, uh, to, to gather in order to, to come up with a, with a prototype. So this is, this is how much I have to work with. These are my constraints for the prototype. Corporate financing then talks to engineering. Uh, sorry, the client talks to corporate financing with a cost, uh, what do you call it, like a cost uh, suggestion saying that this is based on the design that we've gotten from this person. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a blueprint for a prototype and this is how much we feel that we need in order to, to make the initial prototypes and so on. So client talks to corporate financing Corporate financing uh, looks at the budget and talks to the engineering department, and the engineering department says that okay, well, we can uh, we can create these materials and and these pieces, and we can generate sort of the the parts necessary and put it all together uh, based on this budget. And then the engineering then uh, talks to production, says we need these parts, these pieces, and this is how this is going to look. Uh, production talks to uh, marketing and distribution, uh, which are responsible for resources. And the marketing department might say that, well, this is too expensive. It's never going to fly. You have to replace these materials. Going back to production, engineering, corporate financing, and the client saying that we can't make this thing out of metal. Is there any way we can make it out of plastic or it's too heavy or who's the, you know, given the target audience for this, maybe we want to change this and that and this and that. So marketing and distribution have, have some suggestions. You see here, critic, there's a critic here, uh, or critique. Uh, marketing and distribution eventually uh, leads to the product going on sale uh, or going to, to be sold in, in stores or, or you know, for a consumer to buy. The consumer then buys it, uses it for a while, uh, and during use, we need to figure out some sort of storage solution maybe for this product. Like where, where can, we, uh, can we build parking lots? Can we build parking garages? Can we build uh, bike racks? Can we build, you know, where during use, if we flood society with these products, how are, we, how are people supposed to store this product if it's a largest product? Figuring out storage and use, that goes round and round. Then, then there's the social and cultural impact. You know, something becomes very popular. Something becomes part of the subculture. Something uh, generates, you know, uh, uh, massive discussions in society and so on and so forth. So this is all stuff that goes on during use. Uh, we then need to have some sort of contract for maintenance and repair. We need to build workshops. We need to have uh, support, IT support. We need to have some sort of infrastructure for, for maintenance and repair and also eventually retirement. Like what do we do with products that have gone, uh, that have gotten too old? Uh, how do we deal with recycling and waste? You know, the ecological, uh, you know, the, the end of the life cycle. Are we, are we able to recycle the product once it's being, it, it's, it's deemed uh, that it has run its course. So, so, so this is the design sort of uh, stakeholder model these are all the different people and different sort of corporate entities that are part of a design process, really, that have to, to, to agree and come together. So it's much more than just talking about a, a user. And so the user is a myth. There is no one user. There's only the stakeholder model. There's only, there's only sort of... Um, all these various corporate entities that are involved in the life cycle of a product. Uh, I'll skip the trajectory of artificiality. I will refer you instead to the very excellent uh, Klaus Krippendorf uh, lecture, which you will find there's a link on the portal for this. You can watch the YouTube clip where he talks about this in a much better way than I do. So the last thing that we're going to talk about here is the idea of meaning and use. So, so what, what happens when a person first sort of um, um, encounters a product, you might say? Well, the first thing that happens um, is that there is some form of, uh, uh, shall we say, um, 
cognition and acquisition. We can we can start here somewhere, you know, with acquisition. You know, you you're made you're made you're cognitively made aware. We're not at recognition yet. We're not at recognition. We're at cognition and acquisition. So you're made aware of a product. You buy the product, and then there's always an element of exploration. You know, you don't know how the product works yet, but you're testing, you're intuiting, and you're trying various things. You know, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? Does this work? How does this feel? And so on. Well, you know how it is. When you buy a new car, for instance, you try out all the buttons and you wonder, where's this? Where's that? How's this feel? Where do I adjust the seat? And how, how, how do I activate the, the uh, cruise control and, and all this kind of stuff, you know? So it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a phase of exploration. And if exploration goes well, uh, it results in engagement. You become sort of engaged in the product. You're starting to feel sympathetic to the project, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the product. And once this exploration phase has, has made you engage with the product and it goes and it, and it becomes sort of productive, uh, then you go over to this phase of reliance. Then you rely on your uh, explored and newfound knowledge on how this product works. And ideally, you can go from reliance just to this kind of circle of use here. And this goes well until there is some sort of disruption. Something happens. Uh, there's an error message or something goes wrong or it doesn't work. Then you go, there's a, dis there's a disruption and you go back to exploration again. So you have to explore, so, okay, how do I fix this? How do I do this? How do I, you know, and you consult manuals and you try things and you Google and you try to explore and see how can I fix this problem? Ideally then, it results in engagement and you're back to reliance and use. Uh, if, it's, if it doesn't work um, and uh, it, it, you're unable to fix the problem, it results in discouragement you become discouraged and it's back to recognition. In other words, you have to change your mental model of how this product works. You have an idea in your head at first, what is this product that I have bought? The cognition uh, part, so to speak. So what happens now is the recognition. You have to sort of revise your understanding of this product a little bit. And hopefully that leads to new knowledge acquisition which can then lead to some exploration and so on and so forth. Now, uh, if that doesn't work, then there is a permanent change then from reliance to disengagement, which means that I'm not gonna use this product anymore. I'm going to throw it out and I'm going to find a new product instead. So if we can't, if we can't sort of uh, through the act of exploration and recognition, fix this disruption, then it goes from use and reliance here to disengagement. And we have to find a new product or, or reconceptualize sort of what we, what we know about a product. And all this stresses the uh, importance of language, you know, when we understand a particular design or when we understand what design does. Uh, a design is a system of signs and symbols it's a medium of individual expression, particularly when it comes to artistic uh, design products or even artistic works in and of themselves that have been designed somehow. It's, a, it's an expression of who you are as a person because you own this thing. It, it's also a medium of interpretation. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an artifact through which you can interpret other things. Uh, the process of coordinating the perceptions and actions of its speakers, of, the, of its designers, uh, language directs attention to certain things and also establishes categories. You know, you, by establishing sort of technological jargon that uh, connects to a certain type of product, you know, what's the difference between a station wagon and an SUV, for instance? Uh, I might not know that as a person, but I'm sure that there are certain formal um, definitions of what constitutes an SUV. Maybe it's higher sort of ground clearance and it looks a bit more robust, the suburban utility vehicle, right? A station wagon is more longer and less Jeep-like, you know, there, but there's some sort of, the, the, these are two uh, similar vehicles, but they exist in separate categories. So language directs attention to certain features of the product 
establishes these categories, coordinates perceptions and actions of how something is used, and also serves as our aid in interpreting and expressing ourselves and, and, and organizing all these signs and symbols that, that govern the artifact. So, um, yeah, I think I'll stop there and um, I will make an additional video clip uh, that talks about this last bit of behavioral design. Thanks for watching. <laughs>